Okay, then let's start. Hello again, my name is Rainer Andres from CFX Berlin and I will give you an introduction um, on our software TwinMesh today, um, which we use as a tool to allow the efficient numerical analysis of rotary pumps and compressors. So the webinar today has a few topics. So at first I will start with, with a brief introduction of our company CFX Berlin and then we will jump to the modeling background of TwinMesh. I will explain to you what is the approach in the first place and why is it helpful for these machines. Um, after that we will have a look at some application examples. So um, I have some generic examples um, which um, show you bold and simple um, what results can you expect. And then we have a, a bit a closer look at a screw compressor with oil injection. And um, the second part of the webinar consists of a um, live demonstration where I show you how you can create uh, numerical meshes for a screw compressor. So CFX Berlin, so our company is located in Berlin and actually here on the slide on the right hand side you can see our office building. It's a, um, a few subway stations away from Alexanderplatz and we are now doing um, simulation for over 20 years. Um, we are active in the fields of fluid mechanics mainly um, and thermodynamics but we also do structural mechanics, electromagnetics and coupled physics. Um, as a company we have the following business areas. We are a distributor of ANSYS software and also um, of um, the software Flonex and Particleworks um, while TwinMesh which is our topic today this is our own development. So we develop the software in-house. Um, we also um, provide appropriate hardware for our customers and also we do um, training on our software support and um, consulting services. We also have a, a small research and development uh, department in our office um, where we work on um, yeah, challenges where are no um, built-in solutions um, in, the, in the software are available yet for example. And also we get a lot of support from um, our students here. Then let's talk about TwinMesh. Um, maybe some of you know it already and for those who don't, TwinMesh is a meshing software which is specifically designed to generate the grids for positive displacement machines. Um, that means we do not simulate um, in TwinMesh itself. We only provide the meshes and then we can use them um, in yeah, any software we basically like but in this case it would be the CFD package of ANSYS and on this slide the workflow is depicted like this. Um, you would start generating the grids in TwinMesh for the working chamber of your machine, so of your pump or of your compressor and then you, you take these grids, you combine them with the grids um, of the stator and here you can use for example ANSYS meshing or ISIM um, and if you assemble everything together you will end up in the preprocessor. In this case it would be CFX Pre. You can also use Fluent and then you do the simulation, uh, simulation as usual and in the end you will post-process your results. And at the moment TwinMesh is available for different machine types. Um, here you see the most common ones. So um, we have the pump um, type, so external or internal gear pumps, G-rotor pumps or low pumps, um, also vein pumps um, are possible and we have the compressors such as screw compressors or scroll compressors. Um, there are also uh, machine types which may be a bit more exotic, um, for example eccentric screw pumps um, or bunkle engines. So each of those machines um, have a, a topology in common which can be meshed with the twin mesh approach. 
Yeah, as I said in, in the beginning, since TwinMesh is our own development, we can sell it internationally. So we have customers from all over the world which are using TwinMesh for their development. Um, of course, we are not uh, allowed to share um, yeah, everyone who is using the software, but here on the slide you can see a couple where we can say um, those are our reference customers. Okay, first of all, um, why um, do, you, do we use um, a specific approach um, to cope with positive displacement machines? Um, positive displacement machines, um, they all basically have rather complex geometries um, where the meshing would be challenging in any case. But in addition, um, we have rotors which are spinning, of course, so we have a continuous change of the fluid volume. And if we look at um, such a machine, like here on the slide, this is a, a screw compressor. Um, the first challenge is, um, okay, the rotor geometry is complex in the first place, but also we have small clearances between the rotors and the housing. So for example, we have the intermesh clearances between the two rotors, then we have the um, radial or housing clearances here, and um, we have axial clearances between rotors and housing. Then um, also we have um, complex flow characteristics. Um, for example, here, of course, we have to deal with compressibility of the fluid, and depending on your operation conditions, you also have to account for real gas properties. For example, um, if you have a a pump, maybe you could think of cavitation, which could occur, and you want to be able to um, account for these phenomena. Those challenges um, lead to specific meshing requirements in order to um, achieve a reliable CFD calculation. And this is where we try to help with our software. Um, let's have a look. What are the challenges for the mesh? Um, so the statement of this slide um, can be summarized real quick. Um, for the positive displacement machines, um, and especially because of the tight clearances, we require a high mesh quality. From experience, we know, for example, that the minimum element angle should be higher than 18 degrees. Um, the volume change should be larger than um, or lower than 10, for example, and the aspect ratio should not exceed a value of 1000. Um, those values are not written in stone, of course, it depends on what solver you are using, um, but you have to um, yeah, achieve a certain mesh quality. Um, what do you want? You want a fast mesh generation um, with a small manual effort, but you, you don't want to sacrifice um, mesh quality. What other approaches are there? Um, so before we developed TwinMesh, um, we already tried to um, simulate pumps and compressors and we also used different approaches in the past, but each of them, they lack a bit of feasibility. For example, um, you could name um, the three main approaches um, on this slide. Um, such as the overlapping meshes, where you have one background mesh and one mesh which represents the rotors. Um, it's quite easy to implement and to use, but uh, typically you have an insufficient wall treatment and also an insufficient gap resolution. Um, and as you might know, um, the performance the, or the leakage through the gaps is crucial on the pump or the compressor performance. Also, you might have very large models um, if you want to overcome this issue. And um, sometimes, depending on the solver, the model availability is limited. For example, um, a multi-phase simulation might not be supported for this approach. Then the next approach, um, this is what is can be seen on the right-hand side here. Um, this is the autom um, automated uh, tetrahedral remeshing approach um, and this works because only tetrahedral cells are used um, 
yeah, most of the times without uh, um, a prism layer at the walls, and here you have similar problems, um, you get rather large models, but also interpolation errors and stability issues, because if you rotate, for example, the upper rotor just a bit, um, you get skew elements within the gap really fast. And then there is the necessity to recreate the mesh. Um, and since the mesh to topology um, is different, um, the solver needs to interpolate. Then the third option would be um, handmade hexahedral grids. Um, for example, you could go to Ansys ISIM CFD and you generate um, yeah, a perfect match with a very good quality. Um, but um, the problem is you have a really high manual effort. If you think about um, a three-dimensional screw compressor where you have um, twisted rotors, maybe you will need several weeks until you have a finished mesh for all rotor positions you want to account for. And this is where TwinMesh um, tries to, yeah, to provide advantages um, in order to get reliable results, but also to allow for a fast answer. And this is how we assemble it. So we have a time-dependent change of our Floyd volume here in the working chamber. And only in within this volume, we use our grids. This can also be seen on the, on the bottom picture here. Um, you see the underlying CFD grid. Here, the, um, the flow field is solved and we connect this with the stator parts of our pump and here you for the static parts you could um, yeah, include as many parts as you want so as for um, yeah cases you might already be used to then let's have a look at some simulation examples of rotating pd machines so here we see um, a simulation of a vein pump and here um, pressure induced effects uh, could be seen for example if you look at the left picture or the left animation here you see um, as soon as um, this chamber here has connection to the pressure port um, yeah there is the gas is ejected with a high velocity because we have over compression in this chamber um, you see the corresponding pressure field on the center animation. Um, so the pressure exceeds a certain value and then um, yeah, it has connection to um, the, the pressure port where we have the ambient pressure and the right animation shows the grid. And this could be the basis of an, yeah, an optimization um, task where you could arrange the port in a way that um, this over compression does not appear. Then here on this animation, we see a rotary low pump um, with twisted rotors. We see the flow field on different cross sections within um, the pump. And on the bottom, uh, on the top right animation, we also see um, vectors which visualize the flow field within the axial clearance of this pump. So the idea is once you have the solution, you can, um, look at each distinct position within your machine and evaluate the flow quantities. Then another example, um, it's also rather eye-catching, I would say, but it, yeah, I think it um, gives you a good impression um, what to expect. Here, this is a filling process of an external gear pump, um, where at the beginning, um, the pump is only filled with air and then over time it fills um, up with water and yeah you see um, these vortices which are forming in the corners of the stator of course this is a very generic and simple model but um, also for your real models um, you would be able to analyze the flow patterns within certain regions of the pump and if needed you could improve um, the pump
And here we see an internal gear pump. Um, it's quite similar to the last slide, except this one is not a multi-phase simulation. Here the flow patterns are um, visualized with a passive scala or a tracer, which was added um, to the equations. But also you get a, a really good impression what the flow field um, yeah, looks like within your pump, because as you know, um, with your experimental setup, it might be not so easy to have um, this insight um, in your machine. And also, if you think about optimization, maybe um, you can achieve um, yeah, you can achieve this quicker than building up a prototype for each um, modification you do. We have a website. Um, www.twinmesh.com um, where you get the latest updates about TwinMesh and also we have a, a small blog there where we share success stories of other companies or also scientific papers um, which use the approach. So um, there is a variety of information um, you could get and read through if you are interested in this topic. Um, but let's come to our other example. Um, which also um, fits quite nicely to the live demonstration, uh, which I am going to show you. This is a screw compressor with oil injection. So I will just give you a, a few words about the geometry, the operation conditions, and um, a few numerical settings. Um, so on the right-hand side, you see the numerical setup. So it's a, a compressor where the male rotor has five lobes, the female rotor has six lobes, and both are using the SRM profile. The built-in volume ratio is 2.2, and the male rotor spins at 6,000 RPM. Um, to realize the multi-phase simulation, we use the volume of fluid approach. Um, in this case, it's the homogeneous um, volume, of, volume of fluid model in ANSYS CFX. Um, for the gas phase, we have air as an ideal gas. It um, enters the compressor down here at the suction port and is ejected up here at the pressure port. And then we have four different oil injection ports which are um, aligned around the rotors. And um, yeah, as a boundary condition, we specify pressure and temperature at air and oil inlets um, for the inlet of the air, we have just one bar absolute pressure and 20 degrees Celsius. And at the outlet up here, we have absolute pressure of three bar and 50 degrees Celsius. At the oil, oil inlets, we have a pressure of 2.5 bar. So there is an overpressure which forces the oil into our compression chamber. Um, the angle increment, which um, per time step, which the male rotor rotates, is two degrees for this simulation. And this refers to a time step of approximately 55 microseconds. As for the mesh size, um, of course, this um, depends on yeah how, how good you want to resolve um, the flow field locally, but from experience, um, yeah. There's a certain mesh resolution which um, appears feasible. And here we have 300,000 nodes for the stator parts. So basically the two um, tubes connecting to the working chamber. And for the working chamber itself, including all the clearances, we have around 1.4 million nodes. And here is an animation of the simulation results. Um, on the left-hand side, we see the pressure field um, on a cross-section through the center of the compressor. And also we see the pressure on the rotors and the vectors indicate the flow pattern in the different pressure and suction ports. And we see that periodically the oil is injected uh, into the working chamber depending on the rotor position and yeah, the corresponding pressure field, of course. And on the right-hand side, we see the oil volume fraction, which shows us, okay, um, what is the oil distribution within the machine? 
Um, and here this is mainly plotted on um, the rotor surfaces. It dissipates quite quickly within the working chamber as we would expect it, um, but of course it also depends on the, the pressure at the injection ports and the mass flow which is then entering the machine. For your information, um, this simulation was running for 10 um, revolutions of the male rotor and this took approximately 34 hours on a 32 core machine. So that means on one hand you are able to analyze the 3D flow field within the compressor. Um, you would typically look at the oil volume fraction to see how is the oil distribution within the compressor. You are able to analyze the gap flow. For example, we have here the radial gap and um, at the front here the axial gap between rotors and housing. But you are also able to have a look at time resolved quantities. Um, for example, the volumetric efficiency could be of interest here. And yeah, this is shown here. Once we start the oil injection, um, the efficiency increases from about 60% to over 70 or nearly 80%. So we have an increase of um, uh, around 18% here in this case. And yeah, at the bottom we see also a picture of the oil mass flow at the different oil injection ports. Um, and also this, you could play around with the values and see what gives you the best compressor performance in the end if you vary the boundary conditions. For those of you who might be already working with twin mesh um, and especially for compressor cases where we have um, highly um, twisted rotors, um, we have some improved meshing capabilities with the latest releases of twin mesh. So I just depicted two here. Um, the first on the left hand side, um, here we, we are now able to create a single volume for the working chamber. This also means all clearances, so radial and axial clearances are added to this volume and you no longer have the necessity to create interfaces between the different um, volumes. So this helped us a lot also for the multi-phase cases um, to improve stability. And the other um, feature would be that now we are able to, um, yeah, based on our hexahedral grid in twin mesh, we are able to split the hexas again into prisms. Um, it, yeah, we could show that um, especially if we have twisted rotors, um, you have um, edges of the mesh which are able to better follow the contour of the rotor. Um, so that means um, your gap discretization. Um, gets a bit better and you are closer to yeah to the gap it's supposed to be rather than smearing it with with your mesh. Okay that's it for the example um, and now I want to show you what is the workflow um, from geometry to a finished simulation setup. And we will do this at the same geometry you saw at this example for the oil injected simulation. Um, so this is the compressor and our goal is to generate numerical grids for the working chamber and then we hopefully will end up with a ready to run um, setup in ENSYS CFX. Okay, then let's bring up space claim on my screen. And let me show you the geometry once more. And let me just hide a couple of things. So this um, would be our compressor, like we saw on the slide already. And now the question for you would be, um, what, um, yeah, what are the essential steps um, to prepare here? And if we look at the compressor, of course we have the casing and the two rotors. And yeah, really the only thing we need for twin mesh is a 2D cross section of our working chamber. It means something like this, where we look at it this way. 
And what is interesting for us is um, the rotor curves, so the rotor profiles for male and female rotor, and the enclosing housing curves, so those two curves. Those are needed uh, in twin mesh, and it's, this makes it um, quite straightforward here. You could just hide everything except um, the two rotors, like this. And in SpaceClaim, it's also quite easy um, yeah, just to extract those curves. Would go to a new construction sheet, for example, copy and paste the rotor profile here, and you could save it as an iGES file. So this is the import, for, import format for TwinMesh. Um, depending on how you are working in your company, um, if you have the rotor profiles, um, as an analytic function, you could also um, export um, the coordinates of your profile, so a, a point cloud in a CSV format, and then you could also import this to TwinMesh. Okay, this is the first step, um, the housing curves. You can also um, export them from your CAT model, or if the housing curves are just two circles, like here, um, you can also create them within TwinMesh, um, and this is the way we are going to do it now. Um, the last step would be that you create the fluid volume of your stator. I already prepared this here, so this would be the fluid volume which um, refers to this stator solid. So those are the things we need, and then we can proceed and um, yeah, have a look at TwinMesh itself. So I will start it and then we will import the rotor profiles um, we just extracted. So at the beginning, you see the welcome screen and you are asked for the machine type you want to create the meshes for. Um, so depending on your license, you can choose uh, from all the machine types which are supported. And um, we want to generate meshes for a screw compressor and once I click this, this is set for the whole project and it yeah, applies some um, default options already. So the first step would be that we import our geometry. So we say file import geometry. And I also prepared this already. Um, the profiles are saved as an IGES file. So I double click and then we see them on our screen. And before we do anything else, we just tell the software what are those curves? Are they casing curves, rotor curves? Um, ToolMesh does not know it yet, so we will change this. Um, we will start with the left rotor, which is the male rotor. I will right click and say, select all connected curves to close the loop. Then boundary definition rotor wall curves R1. So R1 would be the male rotor here. And then we will repeat this step for the female rotor, select all connected curves, and then rotor wall curves R2. And that's it for yeah, the geometry assignment. And now we will go to the structure tree and apply some geometry information. For example, let's start with the male rotor again. We see, okay, we are asked for the number of lobes, which is four. This is correct already. Um, axis position X and Y means where is the center of rotation. This is in the origin, so zero, zero is already correct. And the last value we are going to change here is the casing radius. This is um, 51 millimeters. And as soon as I enter the value, I see that TwinMesh automatically draws the, a circle around the rotor, and this will be our casing curve later on. Okay, then let's repeat this for the second rotor. Um, here we are going to change the number of lobes, and we see that we have six of them, and we also have to change the center of rotation, so we have to shift it to the right, so in positive x direction, and the value should be 80 millimeters. And then we see, okay, we have a local coordinate system, which is then 
jumping right into the center of the female rotor. And also here we specify the casing radius. It's a bit smaller than for the male rotor. It's 50.6 millimeters. So no both um, casing curves are generated. We have um, the rotor curves which are assigned. So we are almost done. Um, we can do a, a check uh, and see if everything works as expected because we can now scroll through the different rotor positions and see if yeah the um, if the movement of the rotors makes any sense. Uh, this I think this looks good here. Um, and this is also why you have to specify the number of lobes, for example, so that Pullmesh knows what is the rotation speed um, relative um, of the rotors relative to each other. Okay, then other for the rotor specific options, um, we also have some uh, geometry options which um, yeah, define the, the 3D dimension of the rotors. For example, the rotor length in axial direction this is um, 168.1 millimeters here in this case. Um, and then we have the wrap angle of the rotors. This is minus 300 here. So counterclockwise, if we look in this plane. Okay, then we see there are no red exclamation marks um, at the geometry section here left. So everything looks fine and we are almost ready to generate the grid. Um, there is one um, more thing you have to account for and um, it's concerning the clearances again. Um, because if we zoom in here and we would expect the housing clearance here between rotors and housing, um, as I'm continuing to zoom in, I think you might get the idea that both curves are touching. That means we have zero clearance at the moment between rotor tip and housing. And the same is true at the intermesh um, zone. So here there's even a, smi uh, a slight overlap of the curves. And this is something we have to fix um, because the twin mesh approach, um, it generates two O-type grids. So one O-type grid around each rotor and um, the grid has to go through the clearance. It cannot end left and right of the of the contact here so there has to be at least a small clearance for the mesh and um, yeah now to fix this you could go back to your cat geometry and um, adjust it um, or what is uh, the more feasible approach you adjust it in twin mesh um, so that means we go back to our rotor options and what we do is we apply a small scaling to both rotors and that means at the moment the rotors are touching and now we specify an offset of um, to the curves uh, for example 50 microns and if i zoom in now at the male rotor now we see there is a clearance between rotors and housing you can also measure the clearance and now we would see okay the shortest distance is 50 microns this is, of course, exactly the value we specified. Um, yeah, the good thing is, um, if you do it this way, um, you have a very good control over the clearance size in your model. At least um, you know what the clearance is in the model you are about to set up. Um, it's not so easy to um, determine the clearances in the real world if you have a machine which is running then um, the rotors um, they get hot you have thermal deformation and then it's a, you have to do maybe some assumptions to um, determine the clearance but at least here um, in twin mesh you have the capability to define the value that you are aiming for okay then let's just repeat this for the second rotor we also enter 50 microns here and we quickly check it. And we see, okay, we also have 50 microns here. And since we now scaled both rotors for 50 microns, we probably are going to have 100 microns between the rotors here, which is true. Um, of course, you are able also to, um, to change 
the intermesh clearance separately um, from the radial clearance up here, um, one way would be that you apply a small offset rotation angle to one of the rotors, and then you could um, you could change, for example, the intermesh clearance down here. But for the moment, um, this should be sufficient, and um, we would go to the mesh generation. Maybe one last option I often forget is um, if we talk about clearances, twin mesh generates um, an interface between two rotors um, because, as I said, we have two O-type grids which have to connect um, somewhere. And here it's good practice to specify the smallest clearance that you have in your model. And in this case, this is also 50 microns. Then let's go to the mesh section. Um, of course, there are a lot of options here. You could um, change. Um, this is something you would learn in a professional training of the software. I will just show you the most um, yeah, important settings. So type of meshing, we have different strategies for different machine types. Um, an easy approach is the outer fix method. I will show you what this means. Um, I can highlight the, the mesh distribution or the node distribution on different curves. And outer fix means that grid nodes are placed on your casing curves and they are fixed in place. As the rotor spins, they do not move. And you could, for example, use inner fix, then the, rot the nodes are fixed on the rotors and they rotate with the rotors. And uh, yep, depending on your machine type and your specific geometry, one option makes um, the most sense here for this um, demonstration, I will just use the outer fix method and we will choose a global element size. So at the moment, the default value is 10 millimeters. So this is um, the spacing between two nodes. It's around 10 millimeters. And maybe this is a bit coarse. So we will change it to maybe one millimeter. This looks a bit more feasible and then we can generate the first mesh we say mesh generation right click generate current mesh and after a few seconds um, yeah we see that it has finished um, by the way the process can be parallelized um, here under general you can set the number of cores you want to use um, at the moment, you can uh, use up to 16 cores on your machine. So my workstation has only eight. So I use this value um, and yeah, it scales quite well and you can save a bit of time when generating the grids um, because at the moment I generated only the grid for the first rotor position. And as you go through the rest of the sections, you would also need um, meshes for the remaining mesh sections. By the way, how many mesh sections do we need? Um, in this case, we cover for 90 degrees of the male rotor revolution um, because after 90 degrees, the geometry um, or the rotor has um, the same position. Um, again, of course, the one lobe has traveled for 90 degrees, but um, the geometry is basically the same. And um, with this method, we can uh, create one set of meshes and then um, later in the simulation, we can use this um, set of meshes as for many revolutions as we want. Okay, um, the first mesh, I think it's quite nice already, but of course there are things you could improve. So for example, what you typically want to have is um, a, a refinement at the walls to account for the boundary layer. And you probably want something like this where you have um, smaller cells at the walls and then you get the inflation uh, in the normal direction of the wall. Um, of course, you don't do this by hand uh, like this. Just pulling the nodes, um, you specify the height of the first element directly. You can do this at the rotor wall on the right-hand side here, but also on the left-hand side where the casing wall is. And in this case, I will say 
okay, I want to have a first element height of 2.0.2 uh, .2 millimeters. And once we do this, we probably are going to need uh, a bit more elements in the radial direction. So I will change this value to 20 elements. And the last value I am going to change here, this is the number of nodes um, in the intermesh region here. Um, so here we have um, small clearances, um, but also if we look here at the moment, our mesh is cutting the geometry here. So um, maybe we want to increase the mesh re resolution in this um, part a bit. So I will say I want not 41 nodes on the interface, but let's roughly double it, 81 nodes, and then we will generate the grid once more. And again, after a few seconds, um, it has finished. And now I think it looks a bit more feasible. We have a, a nice mesh resolution. And um, now the question would be, okay, it looks, uh, it, it looks good, but uh, how about the mesh quality? Um, we have different tools to check this. Um, most easily, you would turn on the mesh quality as a contour plot. And by default, you see um, the minimum element angle within the mesh. And Twin Mesh um, indicates where is the, yeah, the worst element in your mesh. And this would be here where we are um, just um, outside of the intermesh clearance. There the elements get a bit skew and here we have around 29.6 degrees um, which is still um, very good so our recommendation would be try to be above 18 degrees but again it's not written in stone if you have 16 degrees maybe um, it's also okay to use this mesh rather to go through the whole process of mesh generation again there are other criteria you could look at, for example, aspect ratio. Um, here we are around four, between four and 500, and our target is below 1000, so it also looks good. And then we have some other like volume change. You could have a look at the determinant of the cells and um, yeah, relative gap size error, which gives you an indication um, of the deviation between your discretized volume and um, your source geometry. Um, but I think the, the first three should be enough for the moment. Um, so volume change is also um, below our target of 10. That means with the current options, um, we get a feasible mesh. And then the next step would be once this is um, achieved, to generate the meshes for all rotor positions. And this is then um, done automatically. You would go to mesh generation and say, generate all meshes. And then when mesh performs the task, um, you get an indication um, of the time left to generate all the 90 grids. Um, it takes one or two um, mesh sections um, until, yeah, this remaining time <laughs> converges, so to speak, but we are in the ballpark of maybe between 10 and 20 minutes. So this is the time it would need um, to finish now. Um, and usually, of course, um, we don't want to wait during the webinar for 15 minutes. So we will just go ahead and open the finished project for this geometry. And I just throw this on the screen. So same geometry, um, except for all meshes are already generated. And then if you scroll through the sections, it looks like this. And once you have all meshes, you might want to check the quality once more, but not like we did before by hand for each of the sections. Um, but we, have, we can look at the mesh quality in a table. So this is what you see on the left side of my screen. For all positions, um, we see the mesh quality and we get a warning if our target is not reached. For example, 
just let me change this value to something like 59 maybe. Okay, now everything is red, maybe 55. Or maybe, maybe a bit lower. Yeah, so if your target would be you want to be better than 40 degrees, then you would get a warning for each mesh section which um, yeah, has an element which is below 40 degrees, then you could jump through this mesh section, locate the bad element and then take action, change some meshing options to, to overcome this. But this is just for demonstration, we are well above 18 degrees here, which means um, our mesh quality is um, acceptable. And the same is true for the aspect ratio, which is below 1000. Or ah, there's actually one mesh section where it's slightly above 1000 here in the intermesh gap. And um, yeah, but I think the order of magnitude is more important here, at least for CFX. Um, so that means we will just go ahead and use this set of grids. And um, yeah, before we go to the simulation setup, um, I did not I did not show you um, the three D mesh yet. And the three D mesh is created once um, you have all the two D mesh slices because we built the three D mesh based on those two D mesh slices. And we can actually see the 3D view here. This is how it looks in 3D. And um, you can also change the 3D parameters uh, on the fly. For example, you could change um, the rotor length in Z direction to a, a different value like this. Um, it, it does not uh, need to remesh everything. It's just a matter of how the mesh is exported once we have the 2D slices. But let's switch it back to the original value. And in 3D, we of course have axial um, clearances. Those clearances can be defined in the also in the geometry tab. It's 100 micron on the two sides of the rotors. And let me just um, change this value, for example, and exaggerate a bit and set it to 10 millimeters. And then in the 3D view, um, you see what changes because here at the front of the rotor, we have um, an additional volume which accounts for the axial clearance. So if I decrease this value again, you can see what happens. Oops, this was, this was the wrong value actually. Um, Let's change this one. Then this additional volume gets smaller again, depending on the value I set. And of course, it's rather like this than 10 millimeters. And the Excel clearances can also be generated uh, within Twin Mesh. So if we go to the Excel gap tab here, um, I'm talking about the grid which is colored now. This is representing yeah, the front end of our rotor, and we can combine this grid with the with the outer grid, which is surrounding it, to account for the volume within the axial clearances. The way to generate it is similar to um, to the working chamber fluid. Um, I will not show it in this webinar. Um, instead, we will now. Um, care about the simulation case setup. This is the last step we have to do before we will end up in NSYS CFX with a ready to run setup. So the idea is um, we want we do not want to um, yeah, substitute CFX as a preprocessor, um, but we want to help you to get a setup uh, more quickly to yeah to accelerate your workflow. Um, so you can do the basic settings here already um, so that TwinMesh has every information it needs to assemble the setup for you. So what do you have to do here? Um, at the beginning, we set the, the solver we want to use. Um, at the moment, NSYS CFX and NSYS Fluent are supported. Um, you choose the type of simulation. It could be a 2D or a 3D simulation. And you um, choose a fluid model. It could be incompressible with or with, without cavitation, or in this case, 
um, of course it's compressible. And um, then in the next step, um, you provide um, the named selections of your state or grid. So um, this is, let me just go to space claim here. Um, this is your stator volume. You generate a mesh for this volume and then you um, typically, you assign some name selections, for example, to this phase, which would be the inlet. And then we have the outlet up here and we do nothing else that just um, provide the names in the simulation case setup. So um, inlet location has the name inlet. You can choose it from the component selection, click accept, and then um, twin mesh knows where it has to set, at which phases the boundary conditions have to be set. Then in the next step, you can also specify the boundary conditions already. Um, of course, as I said, um, you will not lose CFX as a preprocessor or fluent. You can choose every value in, in the preprocessor later on, but um, we can also do it here already. So we have 12,000 revolutions, um, inlet pressure of one bar, outlet pressure of three bar, and then the inlet temperature. And last but not least, we have some solver definitions. For example, how many um, simulation loops you want to perform, which refers to the number of revolutions you are going to calculate, how many coefficient loops you want to use, and if you want to perform in serial or in parallel mode. So typically it would be parallel. And once this is set, you are good to go and say file export setup and what TwinMesh is doing now, um, it um, writes the 2D grids, uh, the 3D grids on your hard drive um, in CFX5 format. And then CFX Pre will automatically open, read all the files and assembly the setup for you. Um, for large 3D cases, this may take maybe a few minutes. Um, in the meantime, um, just let me show you what is the working directory here um, or what are the data which are coming from TwinMesh now. Um, so we are in this folder. Here is our TwinMesh project. And once you click export, you get a folder with the same name. And here you get a subfolder grids and yeah, this is, I think, the most important information in this folder for each of the 90 um, yeah, mesh positions. Um, you see the individual mesh files here. Um, in case you are wondering, it's only 26 at the moment because I was interrupting um, the export process before. And yeah, from those files, the mesh deformation um, um, yeah, is transferred to the solver. So those files, contain the coordinates of each grid node um, for each time step and um, this is how it works. And then you also get um, some um, session files for CFX Pre and also you get the CFX setup as a CCL file. Um, I think this is maybe more important for people which are familiar with CFX and um, all the capabilities but for now the only thing we have to know is okay we have our folder which contains all the grids and also we have a folder which uh, contains the Fortran routine which is shipped with TwinMesh. Um, it handles the mesh deformation for you during runtime. So in the meantime, um, as we can see, um, the setup assembly has finished in the background and we see that um, we might be good to go because we don't have um, an error left here. And of course, um, if you are familiar with CFX already, um, you might recognize a lot of things here in the structure tree. If you see it for the first time, um, don't yeah, don't worry. Um, you also, if you are interested in, in this, you would also learn this in a professional training. Um, the bottom line is you have your compressor, now in the preprocessor um, with all the essential settings already um, applied and you could start the simulation now. Maybe just um, give you an overview. 
um, we see that we have different grids here. Um, they account for the working chambers and also for the axial clearances and everything is assembled as one model. Um, and yeah, I think um, this is already enough information to give you an impression about the workflow. At least this is everything um, I planned to show you um, to give you an idea about uh, the basic um, yeah, steps you have to perform until you are in a state where you could run the simulation. Okay, um, then I will end the live demonstration at this point. And we are also near the end of our um, webinar for today. Um, we have a small, um, or we have in a go to webinar, there's the option to ask questions. Um, I think I forgot to mention it in at the beginning of the webinar. Um, so if you have questions, you could either write them in the chat in the um, in the webinar overlay, or if you have questions later, um, please feel free to write me an email uh, to reiner.andres at cfx minus berlin.de and I will do my best to answer your questions um, as quickly as I can. Um, yeah, I hope it was interesting for you today. Um, maybe you learned something new. Um, if you are interested in more materials about um, yeah, the, the simulation of positive displacement machines or screw compressors, um, um, yeah, just write me an email or contact uh, us. Maybe one of you know our colleagues, Mr. Flach, already. Um, and if you are interested to try it on your own to get started um, with Twin Mesh and with the simulation of those machines, also please contact us. Um, we will try everything we can to help you, of course. Other than that, I wish you a nice day. Um, and maybe we see us or hear us the next time in, the, in another webinar or in the real world of one of the conferences where we um, sometimes are present. Yeah, take care and have a nice day. Bye-bye.